Oh, new Pico 8 version. I wonder what it does. Nice. Hey everybody, I'm Christian from LazyDesk Academy. Welcome to a new thing where we're gonna look at a new version of Pico 8 because it just came out. 0.2.2b uh, is the new version. See, the thing is, where I come from, these kinds of things would have been... Oh, Ugh. So where I come from, this kind of stuff would have been considered maybe fruit salad. We're off to a great start here. Mm. A lot less liquid than I thought. Anyway, so new version of Pico 8, and this is interesting to me. So in the post by Zep, Zep said that he, um, the newest version of Pico 8 should be considered kind of like um, um, polishing stuff, you know, doing updates and so forth. There's still some juice here. And yet something that Zep uh, couldn't stop himself doing from doing is still adding more features to be great and some really exciting ones. He went off to the deep end. It was really exciting to watch this on unfold on Twitter because, you know, it's like, oh, new cool new stuff is coming. There's some cool new stuff happening. I'm going to walk you through the stuff as always. Um, I walk you through the stuff that was introduced in a, in a uh, update post. And I will also walk you through the stuff that I found and um, digging through the change log. Not too much of these uh, this time around and also something that um, I want to do now is there is one feature which are the control codes or control characters which is a bit more advanced and I'm gonna talk about this at the end of the video so we can front load to the more simpler stuff the less you know techy geeky stuff all right let's get started all right version 0.2.2b now uh, superficially as always not much has changed but um, there's some really, really nice little details here, especially if we go here into the sound part, right? In the sound editor. When we switch to this mode, suddenly down here we have the filters. This is a big deal. I've seen this on Twitter. It's, it's amazing. I love it. It's the way it's implemented. It's so good. So basically each new sound effect or each sound effect now has um, five filters that can be applied to it and they are applied to the entire sound. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of like one, you set it once for the entire thing. You cannot set it per note or something. And the five filters are um, noise, bus, detune, reverb and dampen. Let me walk you through the filters real quick. Now I have to say at this point that I am not a musician, I am not an expert in when it comes to music kind of stuff. So I will link you to a post um, by, or a video by a good friend, Gruber Music, who has, you know, all the juicy details and can explain exactly what's wrong and, and what's new and, and how to use all this stuff. He has some really good series about this. This is just like, you know, what I'm gonna talk about is like my impressions as a lay person, like something that I might be interested in as a non-musician. And I'm still excited about this, even though I'm not a musician. So, um, first of all, the first filter here, noise, is kind of like maybe the simplest one, and the pink maybe should give you an idea. So let's just make a, a, a nice little melody, right? There's a nice bit of a melody. Let's make it a bit faster. Uh, slower. <laughs> the other one, not faster. <laughs> Whatever. So if you flip this, nothing changes. That's because this noise filter is only applied to uh, to the pink one. So that's why the, the the switch is pink because it only applies to the pink instrument. So let us um, switch everything to the pink. Is that not everything pink? No, there's like a keyboard. There we go. Shift and click changes everything to, to, to that instrument. That sounds weird, right? So if you switch it, So 
So this, uh, this what's the name there? Yeah, the noise instrument now basically has a second mode. It basically has adds a whole second noise instrument from what I, I, I would say. So it's kind of like we have like two different kinds of noise instruments, two different types of noises. Um, the new instrument basically, the one with the noise filter, feels about a lot more rougher and and like I don't know crunchier. Uh, and I think this really adds um, ability to uh, do cool explosion effects. So let me try this real quick. Can I do a quick explosion effect? I guess something like, you know, something like this, right? Maybe also like in, in volume. And of course it has to be quick. Well, uh, maybe a bit more sudden. See, it gives us a lot more like um, abilities to like percussive sound. Is that the term? Like like hit, punch, uh, swoosh, explosion kind of sounds. Gives us a lot of more tools to do these kinds of sounds. You've maybe seen a recent game that was released called um, Poom. That was kind of like a remake of Doom on Pico 8, which is kind of amazing. Made by uh, Paranet Cactus and Frederick So Chu. So 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 Chu. I'm I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name, it's it's horrible. Um yeah, no, two geniuses in Pico 8 community. And they did an amazing job, like probably the most amazing game that was released on Pico 8 so far, technically. Um anyway, they had sound effects that were um, were reminiscent of the sound effects in Doom. However, um because of the limitation of, of Pico 8, because of our problems with with you know limited the number of, of um instruments, they always sound a little bit dull. And I, I kind of wonder if, like, with the new filters, if they can make um, the sound effects uh, sound more, more juicy, you know, more crisper. That would be interesting. So anyway, yeah, this is a really, really good thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I love it. I love it. Uh, moving on. So bus, detune, and reverb are all filters I feel that just add more, more richness to a sound, kind of like just add more depth, the, the sounds feel feel deeper. Uh, let me try to do something. So bus adds more like a buzzy quality to this. Right, let, let me put it more. Right, it's it's a bit more buzzy as if you have used more maybe no more the sawtooth um, instruments. Detune. It's like a second voice, and you can make it even more 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 extreme. Way actually, I also in <laughs> activated reverb. Reverse adds like a reverb, like a kind of like echoey kind of thing. This is without it. Sounds like you're playing the sound in a room and you're kind of like getting the acoustics of the room in it. And dampen. So again, the first one is like a new noise instrument. These kind of like add more depth to sounds. And dampen is my favorite here because dampen is kind of like, a, I think it's a low pass filter, I think. Is it a low pass? Yeah, I think it's low pass. So I, I guess the idea is that it cuts off the high frequencies and only leaves the lower frequencies, which makes the sound uh, um, sound muted a little bit more. So it's kind of like as if you're he hearing it through a pillow. And this is really great because it kind of addresses a big problem I had with, with generally PQ8 so far. So generally I had the problem I have with PQ8, with the sound effects in PQ8 or like with the uh, musical capabilities of PQ8 is that we didn't have really a lot of resolution in the quiet sounds, right? We can make a sound go really loud and then a bit quieter and then turn it off, but we couldn't make it get like really, really, really quiet, right? So let me, this is now with dampen off. So this is the highest um, volume, right? And this is like half volume. <laughs> That's half, right? And this is the lowest volume. So it's a bit quieter, but the next step down is turn it completely off, right? So this is the quietest sound. This is half volume again. 
and this maximum volume. There is not a lot of resolution there, like there's not a big difference here. And the difference between this sound and completely nothing is way bigger than the difference between this sound and this sound. Right? <laughs> you can hear the difference, <laughs> but between this and, and nothing is it's like, <laughs> this is just so, there's so much the resolution is just missing down there. Um, so with the dampen filter, we are able to kind of mute the sounds a little bit, so we kind of access sounds that are a little bit more quieter, right? So it kind of sounds like as if you turn down a little bit of the volume. It's not the same because you're also muting, like you're kind of like mudding up the quality of the sound, but it gives you the ability to um, add more subtlety to the sounds. Uh, or like work with the sounds more in a more subtle fashion. I wonder why Zap did it like this. Um, I speculate that the idea was kind of like, you know, uh, these kind of 8-bit consoles, 8-bit games used to be kind of brash and, you know, loud and and and, and annoying maybe a little bit sound-wise. So it kind of like, maybe it, it was a deliberate choice to, to, to only allow you to have like different, very loud sound effects um, to kind of force you out into this kind of uncomfortable loud space and into into this in the, in the open and not try to fiddle you know with like little tiny little clicks and bloops because that's not how those old consoles sounded however now we've given a little bit more um abilities to to do something in this space without actually having to redesign the entire interface you know adding more resolution and changing the memory layout i love it it's really good Mwah. Mwah. and while we're here there's another feature that i want to discuss which i Honestly, thought was always there, but apparently it wasn't. So, okay. So you can use these buttons up here. Like if I have a bigger sound effect, you can use them to define an ending point and start point of a loop, right? So if you set them, then the actual sound effect is going to be just this part and we'll just loop over and over again. Now you can do something interesting. You can do, if you set the second parameter to zero. So if the second parameter is at zero, it, the sound stops here and it doesn't loop. So if you use it in a in a pattern editor, it stops here, even though there's some more stuff happening here. So you can actually make sounds that are shorter, and it, the first column always defines you know the length of the entire pattern. So yeah, you can do tricks with that. You know, it's good. Um, I recommend this is the point where I really recommend you to check out uh, the Gruber music tutorial to kind of like figure out what's happening there. It's it gives you more abilities of, of tweaking the timing and doing like music with interesting kind of timing. Moving on, while we are here, I wanted to discuss some UI stuff that is really interesting. So first of all, this is really cool. There is a hex mode happening in the map editor now. So. Uh, one problem that you might sometimes might have is you make sprites that are identical and you draw them on the screen and you cannot turn uh, tell them apart visually you just cannot tell which sprite is drawn because they're identical or very, at least very similar and it might be difficult to uh, distinguish them so you can press now a uh, control h and it will turn the map edit view into like a hex view so now you can actually tell you know, um, there's a number written in each cell indicating the different sprites that are selected. And if you actually select a sprite in the in the window down here, those uh, tiles that are using the sprite will light up. So this allows you to kind of quickly find out, you know, where you use the certain sprite, even if they are very difficult to tell them uh, tell them apart from each other. While we are also here, Shift Tab is also a new thing that puts uh, an editor into full screen. So now you see no UI and just, you know, the actual thing, which is really nice. For example, when you are editing the entire sprite map, you can also use it in, in this one. So you can, now you can really edit, well, no, maybe not in this, but if we zoom out all the way out, now we can edit the entire, you know, you can edit the entire sprite sheet at once. So this is the entire sprite sheet of P create. So this is also really cool for something like, <laughs> I always have this problem at the end when I made my, my uh, Pico 8 cart, I want to make the uh, cart image. And it's always like this hack that you have to, like, this, this, you know, you have to copy and paste and save and whatever. Um, 
but now you can like uh, drag and drop an image into the sprite sheet press f6 to, um, to capture the the uh, the card image from here like go full screen capture the sprite image from here and then you know uh, the, the revert the sprite sheet to what it was before um, so it's kind of like a very quick way of doing, uh, of seeing the entire sprite sheet at once and uh, capturing the, the uh, card image like that. Really nice. Um, and then final uh, UI tweak that I was also interested in, you can right click in this mode, you can right click a um, uh, an instrument to select it. So let's say I have here a blue instrument, I can uh, right click the red one no, uh, I can right click the blue one to select the blue one and right click the red, red one to select the red one. So you can kind of like um, use a pipette tool, I guess is the name, uh, to kind of like grab uh, different sound effects from here. Very nice, very useful. It's chewy. Anyway, moving on to um, two cool types of export. And let me let me load up some cool stuff to export. So this is pork-like, obviously, a mm. mm, beautiful game. And so there's a new way of exporting pork-like or exporting your cards. So when you go export pork.lua.png, uh, you will get this. So this is the entire source code of pork-like in, in, on one page. That's kind of blows my mind <laughs> because I've been sitting for this for such a long time and now it's like over there. <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, so yeah, so what it does is like it puts um, the entire source code into, uh, I think and it's um, the image uh, always is an A4 sized. So it's kind of as the proportions are always A4 so you can print it out. And um, it truncates every line at like 18 characters. So it's a bit wider than what Pico 8 window allows, but not too much wider. So you can see that some of the lines are truncated. And yeah, and just prints out all of the code. They're kind of useful if you want to maybe... I mean, it's probably the best for just printing out. I might actually print out some of the code and put it on my frame it on my wall. <laughs> uh, maybe like, you know, um, also, um, if you want to share it in a video or something, or maybe like a, I don't know, it's 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 very it's just very neat. It's just fun. It's just nice to watch. It's to to see you know your the fruits of your labor just like red like all splayed out. All it's all there. You know, it's really nice. There's a second thing that you can do here as well. So for this one, I'm actually gonna load not my game. It's gonna I'm gonna load a game of one of my students that he made way back a couple of years ago, before I came to um, to China. So this is called Spook and Thunder. And it's a really awesome game. You walk around and shoot the ghosts with a shotgun. And there's some beautiful rain happening. It's, it's beautiful, check it out. Uh, it's called Spook and Thunder. But anyway, um, I'm here to go export uh, Spook and Thunder dot map dot png. png, there we go. And this is what you get. This is the map, the entire map of of the game exported as a huge PNG image. So if you have like games with you know a lot of level design and so forth, you can export it as PNG image. And I think this is actually a lot more useful than the other one uh, because you can actually you know draw uh, and, sh and discuss it with other with with your with artists. You know if, if you collaborate in a team, you can just like sit huddle around this map and then point at things and draw over things. And somebody even make like an export module into like external tile editors. So you can load it in an external tile editor, or convert it to tiles, and edit there and export it back to Pico 8. So this is really useful. This is really fun. Um, of course, not all games use the map, but if you are depending very much on map, this is very useful. Okay, I'm into it now. All right, now to the Cody stuff. There is a thing that we can do with menu items. So you might know that if we, let's go like uh, function. So if you run a Pico 8 cards, uh, let me do a CLS there. So if you run Pico 8 cards, you can press, es uh, not escape, you can press enter. There we go, to access this menu and um, yeah, that menu allows you to restart the card or whatever, but you actually have the ability and I don't think... Did I ever discuss this? 
I might have done it in one of my tutorials. Anyway, you can add your own menu items to the menu. And for the longest time, I'm not, we're not sure about this. And actually, in my chess, in Pikui chess, I actually made my own menu, and I think I should have used this menu instead. So you can actually add your own entries into this menu, into this default Pikui 8 menu. And that's very useful. So how you do this is uh, something like this menu item. Uh, then one is, that's kind of like, I think, the number, kind of like... Um, each menu item gets a number and in this case the one is going to be like no num menu and item number one this is useful for for later on when you want to like replace the menu item with something else um, then the text that should, should appear in the menu and then here this thing my menu item that is going to be a callback function this is the function that will get run executed when somebody selects this menu item and so we have to actually write this function now as well um, and let's make a beep sound. Let's make it just a sound when this happens. And we're gonna use the new noise filter. Okay. Oh, this sounds like like old Atari 8-bit sound effects. Mwah. Okay, we're gonna do NSFX0 here. Uh, and we're gonna call this explode. And now... It makes a sound effect. You can do whatever here. You could restart the game. You can, I don't know, whatever. So this was already there before. This is nothing new. This was already there before. There is something new though happening now. So now if you return true in this in this callback function, well, we are selecting it, but it doesn't actually run. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Ah, okay, I see the problem. Um, so we, and let me run this. So we select a menu item and the callback function is being run, but we are not returning to the cart and therefore we don't hear the sound effect. So like if we continue, then we hear the sound effect. Um, so returning true in this callback function will keep the menu open, even though you executed something. And this allows you kind of like, manipulate the menu a little bit for example you could change the um you can change the text of 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 the of the thing right so you can do something like menu item mm, i've seen this i'm not really sure um underscore i've seen underscore you zap using underscore i'm gonna use it as well um Loaded. <laughs> so you can see it, it had a D or let's change it to OK so it's more obvious. So I'm selecting it now and you can see it, it changed into an OK. Um, this underscore I think it refers to the menu item that was called I think. What happens if you do a one here? Yeah, you can see it changed into an OK. So you can also use underscore and it will automatically refer to a menu item that um, that ran this callback function. Okay, so you can like, for example, um, you can have something like, I don't know, juice off, and then if you select this, it will turn into juice on, right? Hmm, it worked. <laughs> okay, um, so it allows you to kind of like um, have like options directly into menu and also to kind of like add a little bit more, more little, uh, like a little bit more functionality here. This function also comes with a B, with a variable B. This variable encodes what kind of button was pressed. Because also this, this whole thing is being triggered also when you press different buttons. So for example, you can actually press, press left and right to trigger this. So you can actually go like if, um, and I'm taking this from, uh, from Zep's code, if B and one is greater than zero. So basically um, the B is a variable and has bits assigned to it. So and the bits are indicate what button are being pressed. And this is how you check if, you know, the bit number one was, was pressed. So if that's the case, then um, we 
we're gonna go left and if bit 2 was pressed then we're gonna go right Um, did we do something wrong? I probably did. Oh, 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 what is this? I pasted too much. Yeah, this should be good. So right, left, right, left, right, uh, left, right, left, right. So this is also nice because it allows you to kind of like maybe do something like this. It worked. <laughs> I'm sorry, stupid thing. But yeah, it allows you to switch um, to maybe, you know, being able to manipulate a variable and crank something up and down, like difficulty or so forth. Doing it direct directly in a menu without having to run your own little UI and so forth. It allows you to save a bunch of tokens that way and also make everything more integrated, feel more like um, seamless. Good stuff, good stuff. Now, this next part. I hope I can do this. It's kind of like, um, oof, okay, let's do this. So there is a new JLP, which we should check out. So uh, CD demos, dear load JLP. Yes. Uh, and then if we go into tab number five and then go to a spurt, certain, um, certain function, this init level function, there's something that Zep said that we should paste in here. Now this seems like gibberish, it's like CLS reset, we had that before, but then we have this. And if you run this, what is this? Why is everything hearts now? I mean, I love it, but why? <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's like a pattern overlaid over everything now, and that's confusing and that's weird, uh, but it's also new. Uh, how do we unpack this? Okay, there's a lot of things happening here in this little little thing. This, this means a lot, and that what we saw means a lot. So first of all, very important thing. Um, you might have seen my recent video when I talked about the, the secondary screen palette. If not, you should check it out here. It will appear here. So I was talking about how there's two screen palettes and the one is kind of like not really documented. And if you watch that video, you will see that the secondary screen palette is uh, starting empty. It's just all black. Now that thing has changed, that behavior has changed. So cards created with 0 0.2.2 uh, will have actually a default secondary screen palette. This is what it looks like. Surprising! I thought it would, he would just dump the you know the alternate colors into the you know entirely into the secondary screen palette, but that's not what it what it what uh, what's happening. So this is the official alternate. No, not the, the 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 caption doesn't. It's not the alternate palette. It's the secondary screen palette. Um, so what happened here is the bright colors um, um, get the um, um, the alternate colors the alternate palette colors, but the darker colors basically stay the same, except for maybe the bright gray gets a bit darker. So it's kind of like he, he, um, Zep uh, pick and chose certain colors to be replaced with darker version of it, but only just like the bright colors get darker. So yeah, this is the official secondary screen palette now, and you can like refer to it now. So like for tweet cards, this is very interesting because you don't have to like fill some stuff in the secondary screen palette. You can just use this one and that's fine. So that's something that the Phil P trick um, was using, was referring to. Like it's just something with that. So just keep that in mind as we as we go. Okay, I made a little program here and I want us to go step by step through this little snippet. I'm gonna post it here uh, as a comment so we can like slowly get to what was happening here. Okay, so this is what how it looks like. I have a, a big spread of gel P and it's animated to zoom in and zoom out a little bit. And behind it, there's a vertical um, a vertical uh, dark blue bar just to like show us transparency effect that might be occurring, okay? All right, so let's put a fill P 
heart here. Phil P. Heart. This is like something that we started. This, this, we haven't actually discussed. I never made a t t tutorial about, I think, the film patterns. I don't think I did. Um, but yeah, um, recently we got like this feature that fill patterns can be, have like presets and these are like these special characters and the heart preset will fill everything with hearts. But as you can see, it's, it applies obviously only to rectangles and stuff like that. So if you put it in before you draw a rectangle, the rectangle will turn into a heart. Good. Actually, um, let's not make the sprite. Let's turn this thing into a circle so it's more clear. All right. Okay, this is, this is good, this is really nice. So you can see we have created a fill pattern and the pattern has a transparency to it. So um, um, yeah, so basically we don't have the JLP now, we had just have like a red circle. I'm gonna turn off the pattern, this is what it looks re regularly. And this is what, if, you t if I turn the, the fill pattern just for the circle, after I've drawn the rectangle, I turn on the fill pattern and the circle gets filled in with little hearts. Beautiful, love it. Um, the hearts are transparent, so whenever like, there's like the red that I use for the circle and whenever the pattern's off, it will just show you the background behind it. Okay, but here it's like divided by one. Let's do that. Okay, so this is, has to do with the way patterns work. So uh, I'm actually, I can put in this pattern or something like this. Let's put a pattern like this. It's more of a checkboard pattern, right? This is like basically encoding checkboard into zeros and ones. This is a big binary number. And if I put a comma one at the end, it will turn into a transparent pattern. So this is how I control transparency, how you control whether a fill pattern is opaque or transparent. With an opaque um, fill pattern, you get two colors alternating between two colors. And with a transparent fill pattern, you get the color that you drew the uh, object in and Basically nothing, you punch out holes in it. So you want this if you want to have uh, solid opaque fill patterns. And dividing by one, uh, but the the backslash dividing division, that's actually something that I think was added at some point is basically dividing and flooring. So you kind of like remove everything behind the comma. Uh, <laughs> And it just so happens to be that the heart is basically a stand in for an, you know, like a huge binary number, comma one, uh, comma five, no, comma one. And then, so basically like this heart pattern is, is, is um, transparent by default. So you divide it by backslash divided by one to remove the comma, so make it, to make it opaque. Basically this, this thing here just makes, this thing here makes that fill pattern opaque. That's the trick here. Whew, I need a drink after that one. By the way, if you have opaque patterns, how do we control the two colors? Because I was talking about there's two colors, but right now I see red and black. Can I make the black do something else? You can. Uh, that's controlled by the color that you use for the shape you're, that you're drawing. So here we have eight, that's for the red. But if I want to have something else, well, I have to go higher than 16 uh, because basically what it does is it is a bit thing again. I hate it. <laughs> so it's like um, a color is the number from zero to sixteen, and uh, if you go higher than than sixteen, then the secondary color kind of counts up. So like uh, let me let me go like fifteen is like this. If you go sixteen, now and seventeen, now you see uh huh, you see now you get uh, instead of the black you're getting a, a dark blue. And if you use higher numbers, you're basically getting different numbers as background. That's how you would, that I would express this. It's basically um, the lower four bits are expressing uh, the actual fill color and the, the next four bits are expressing the, the background color, the, the color that is black by default. So you have any can and like any fill pattern has any combination of two colors. Now, this new feature here that we're about to talk about, this new feature will um, allow you to use fill patterns on sprites. And if you think this through, you will very quickly 
come to the conclusion that this is actually very difficult to pull off because a sprite is not just one color. A sprite has multiple colors, there's pixels with multiple, multiple colors in there. And if you use a fill pattern that is opaque, we kind of have to define two colors, like to which color a pixel should, should switch to if it's a background fill pattern color. And that's possible if you fill, like you here, if you fill the entire shape with just one, one, the same color, right? You can just like use this trick here to combine two numbers into one number, and then you can have like two colors uh, alternating between two colors. But if the thing that you're drawing consists of multiple colors in the first place, then you kind of have to do like a mapping, right? You have to do like this color should always turn to this color, this color should to this color and so forth to kind of account for the different colors a pixel can be in a sprite. That's where the secondary display palette is coming in. <laughs> So what Zapdot did here is he has like a um, new use for the secondary display palette. Basically, when you're using a fill pattern on a sprite, then it will alternate uh, between the regular um, display palette and the um, secondary display palette. So you're kind of using the secondary display palette to define the background colors or the fi fill pattern that you're applying to a sprite. All right, good. So. Um, so again, let us st still continue with the circle though. Um, uh, let me put something like in here. So, so the way this works is basically 16 times, let, what, let's, what kind of color do we want to have? Uh, let's go pink, 16 times 14 plus 16, that's how it works, right? Uh, plus eight, yeah, that's good. Um, actually, let's go 16, uh, 16 14 here. And eight here, that, that maybe looks better. Ah, that's good. Okay, yeah, you have to multiply the background color with 16 and you add the foreground color. And that's how you arrive at the number <laughs> that encodes both both colors. Um, so now that we have this this thing here, let's, let's go to the rest stuff. So this, now he uses this character here, this pipe character. That pipe character is, I think, an or, binary or. Or it's, no, it's or, it's or, it's binary or. So he's adding this this binary number as an or, and um, he's basically setting the third and no, the second and third uh, binary number behind the comma. Uh, the one one is, is what he said. So um, I reset the um, the circle and the color of the circle to just eight, so it's like really clear. Um, we run this, we set the fill pattern to opaque, so it alternates between black and red. Um, and then if we set the third bit behind the comma to one, now we are always looking, um, using the secondary display palette as a lookup function to alternate the colors. So now we can apply this uh, secondary screen palette to alternate between two colors uh, for the film patterns on every draw function, including just like regular circle draw. So we don't have to mess with this thing anymore. You can just use the secondary display palette as a function to find out which color should be the background color for the fill pattern. And in this case, it's, it's this brown. That's the, that's the default, right? So that's what the one does. And the second bit behind the comma, that's what turns on this also for sprite drawing. So now we can add our, our little, little doodaroo. This is, uh, this is the little Jelpy, and now you can see the fill pattern on Jelpy. And again, if I turn off the second bit, then Jelpy won't have the uh, fill pattern applied to it, um, but the circle will. Right? And what happens if we just do it like this? Aha! Uh -huh. So now you can see, now Jelpy gets the fill pattern, uh, but the circle it has the fill pattern, but the colors are not defined by the secondary display palette. The colors are defined by whatever I put into the color as I was filling the circle. So it's eight and black because I, yeah, if I go 15, uh, 14 times 16 plus eight, then it's gonna be pink, All right? And then if, again, if I turn it to one, then it will turn brown because now I'm no longer using you know, this as a background color, now I'm using the secondary screen palette. And I know this is like, 
and it's also kind of like a very specific kind of use scenario like what kind of person was like yes finally <laughs> shell patterns on sprites um but let's get not too ha not not too hasty about this this is really nice i saw um especially this using fill pattern on sprites especially if you start sizing sprites like here when you can actually tell that that the pattern is appearing on the sprites because the sprites get really really big if you use any kind of like 3d function i saw this really nicely used in a newest version of pico cad I will post a GIF here. So now we can have like dithering patterns uh, to add more shading to, to the different shapes and so forth. So this is good. This also also applies to T-line as well. So if you're using T-line to use textured lines and create textured polygons, this can this fill pattern can be also applied there. A lot of possibilities to add more depth and more structure to sprites that are scaled and, and, and so forth. So yeah, I don't mind at all. It's good. It's a bit difficult to use, but I think that's the case with fill patterns anyway. It kind of like blow my mind a little bit. Mm. The juice is helping though. And now uh, this is the the next feature is the Poom feature. This was basically a feature that was literally implemented because Poom came out and Poom, Poom blow blew everybody's mind away. And this includes Zep and he actually uh, collaborated with, uh, with the two guys behind Poom to make Poom uh, even better than it was before. So uh, if you poke this into this, um, so now we're getting into the memory stuff. If you poke this value into this value, this is the value that was responsible for turning off the uh, turning on and off the cursor in Pico 8, the dev kit cursor. Um, but if you poke now a different value into that address, you can actually uh, something weird happens. I'm gonna print some stuff on the screen. Oops, let me do a CLS here. Okay, you can see that my mouse, well, you can't see, maybe you can't really see, but my mouse disappeared. My mouse is no longer visible. My mouse cursor no longer is visible on the screen. And the numbers I'm getting up there are numbers, like apps, like numbers that apply to the position of the mouse on the screen. Basically how much, how many pixels on the entire screen the mouse has moved, not just inside the Pico 8 window. I actually now, you know, once I click inside the Pico 8 window, the mouse disappears and I'm basically doing like an FPS control. This is just an FPS control for Pico 8. That's it. That's all it is. Um, it really useful if you're making FPS games. Otherwise, I'm not sure if there's going to be an implementation for it, but I'm sure somebody will find something really good with this. Um, but this is very useful, uh, especially like because, you know, FPS games, people are very used to mouse controls in FPS games these days. It didn't used to be that way. And and so uh, yeah, getting adding this functionality is like very neat and and kind of like wouldn't be able to we it would be very difficult to uh, make this happen without you know Zep jumping in and actually giving us the ability. There is no really good workarounds for this. Okay, let's go. Let's come. To, let's come to the big one, the really big one. Let's start with a little snack. So let's start with a little snack where the print function works a little differently now. There's the print, the actual print function has more functionality. So if you print something like, hello world, hello world, it actually outputs something and you can print that thing also out. 44. Forty-eight. Sixty. So print now outputs the X coordinate of the next character that would be, would be printed if you had continued printing stuff. So basically, you know, it prints hello world, yes. And then the cursor is he would be here next, right? This is where the next character would go, basically. And it print it outputs like it outputs the coordinate of where the next character would go. And this is really useful if you want to combine text and like maybe icons that you created yourself. Maybe there's like a little icon that should appear here, for example, for I don't know uh, RPGs often like to 
do like little icons to implement to indicate you know like oh this is a magical item and then that gets like an item uh, icon inserted into the text well you can do that now basically you can kind of like figure out where uh, where um, the next character would go and you can print something in there like or draw a, a, an item or a, you can draw a sprite in there um, and this is also really good if you want to like quickly calculate the length of the text, like you have like more ability to do that. And it gets like really difficult when you get like into special characters, right? When it's like, oh, okay, this is a wider character, so actually I cannot just count the the characters. I have to actually account for that and so forth. Um, yeah, that's good. It's like it's your but like a tiny little tool, and you can do something like this with this. So I'm drawing a line, and within the line, I'm actually printing a text. And that text uh, outputs a number, and that becomes the starting point for the line, or the end point for the line, actually. And so I can make an underlined text like this. And this text can be dynamic. And the line will adjust accordingly. Um, again, nothing that you couldn't do uh, before, but now it's very, very compact and nice. And, and 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 yeah, it probably also should use these characters. Yeah, you can account for the wider characters as well. It's really nice. It's good. It helps us a lot. So yeah, uh, we did some changes to printing. Why did Zep did that? Hmm? Well, because we have control characters now. What are control characters? Well, let me let me let me unwind a little bit. Let me let me just like. Let me tell you a story. Um, so we heard about Ord. That was like something that we mentioned last time around when you have a character like K, the character K. That's character number 107. And so the character number seven uh, You print character number 107 you will get K and if you print character 108 you will get L and if you print I don't know 29 you will get whatever that is and if you print 240 then you will get this kanji I think that's oh <coughs> oh man I oh mm. Let's not think about my kanji abilities. Um, actually, that's not kanji, that's katagana or hiragana. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, so yeah, um, each character has a number assigned to it. Um, and um, one part of the previous updates was kind of like upgrading the older characters. There are 256 characters in, in, the, in the font. And um, you know, Zep was working on filling out this entire font set and 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 making sure that you know, deciding what which characters go where. Well, after he filled out or used all the characters, we got hiragana, katakana, we got uh, lowercase characters, uppercase characters, and you know, all all the other nice stuff. And there were still some characters left. There were still numbers that weren't assigned to a. Um, to a glyph uh, uh, character. Um, so he thought, hmm, so if we have those numbers left, we can use those numbers to trigger functions. And that was actually already possible previously. So something that you could do is there's a character for line break, uh, a line break character. That's some, the feature of every every you know encoding like this. That that means as a character that it's not really visible on the screen. It's not like there is like a thing that you can see here, but it will cause something to happen in the computer, right? And in this case, the line break character makes you know the, stop the printing and go to the next line of the printing and so forth. So in case of Pico Eight, that was uh, character number ten. So if you go uh, hello. And then go chur ten. Yes, this is dog. I love that old beam. Uh, you can see that this causes the line to break and continue writing in the next line. That's good. Uh, now writing char ten is a bit cumbersome, so there is a way of escaping characters. You can go backslash n, and that's the same as writing 
Chur 10, right? So that's kind of like a line break character and it does basically the same thing. You just have to watch out that you never do a backslash n in your in your text and you'll be fine, it's gonna be fine. Um, so yeah, these kind of like special characters um, always can be a hand, can be escaped. So you can write them out with your keyboard and don't have to like do additions of strings and, and, and launch the char function. Good. So we are always already had this control character, but now we have a lot more control characters. And I, at this point, I would sh show you this part of the, if you look for the control characters in the, in the manual, you will see like all of the control characters are listed here and they are explained, you know, in great detail what they do and so forth. We're going to go through some of them ourselves, but I just want to make you sure that you know that, you know, there are a lot these are all the ca characters and then the one of the characters additional characters there's there's a lot happening here and it might be fun if you're really interested into this actually going to manual and digging into it a little bit so just so because don't trust me on this there's I'm, I'm not this is not a comprehensive special character overview i just we will be here all day if i went through all of this nevertheless we are going to look at some of the more interesting ones the ones that caught my attention okay so uh one thing that we can do here is, for example, do something like invert the text. And that's going to be the, uh, there's a special control character called the backslash, is, is that an uptick? Uh, what's, mm, I don't know what it's called, like this character, this control character, that's a special one. Because that character triggers different effects. It's not just, it doesn't just do one thing, but depending on what you write afterwards, it will do something. So for example, if you do this character and an I afterwards, it will invert the text. So you can see it's like, I'm gonna do the cursor somewhere. Um, cursor 10, 10. So it's not like clipped by the window, but yeah, now the text is inverted. So it draws like a rectangle behind it. And yeah, if you do like a color eight, for example, here, then the text will be red. So it's like the, what, whatever was text color will now get become the background color. And keep in mind that this is not just like a, a function that you call, this is something that you can use within the print statement. So you can write something like, I am so angry. See, it kind of like it's kind of like mm, it allows you to mark up the text, kind of like when you are in a Discord or in using HTML, where you can do like markup effects, like do something bold and do something underlined or whatever. That's what it does basically. You can kind of like do effects on certain parts of the text while you're printing. Um, one general thing that I, I want to, because now if it's on, it's kind of like, oh, oh God, I can't stop. <laughs> you, and then I think it continues in the next print statement. Is this still on? Oh, it's not. Okay, it doesn't continue. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> good to know. But if you want to turn it on, turn it off, you have to go uh, backslash um, this character and minus i. And then you can turn it off again. Okay. And that, that, that applies to all of the special functions triggered by this, this uptick character. Okay, so you can do angry text or inverted text. What else? So the next one is W. So if you go do an uptick w, w, and if you run this, <laughs> the text will get wider. So now every, like, in, in the X direction, every pixel is basically two pixels. So you basically get a new font, if you think about this. You kind of like, this is a, a way to make things things more, more biggish, right? Uh, and you can also do the same thing in a different direction. So yes, you can imagine T will make things like this. Mm. So that's kind of like the same, stretching the text in a different direction. And uh, of course you can do both at the same time. Um, and I think that's, you have to kind of combine them. I'm not sure if there's a, there's a, there's a way of doing this together. Uh, but yeah, so you can combine them to kind of scale the text up. So now it's twice the size. 
So this is good because um, one pro problem that we always had with Pico 8 is like the text is really small, which is fine. You could, it allows you to add a lot of text into the screen. Actually, a lot more. I was playing a lot of Game Boy games recently and I realized how big the fonts are and how little text actually fits on the screen. And what a Pico 8, like they chose the font so tiny, like the tiniest font possible to fit a lot of text on the screen. Um, but also that means that sometimes it's difficult to get like big num big text showing up. And for example, if you have a score, right? If a score shows up somewhere, you want it to be big and the Pico 8 text doesn't allow for that. So you sometimes have to like hack in your own font using uh, uh, the sprite sheet, which is already very limited. Something, for example, I had with the recent high stakes game. I want to have a big text and the text on uh, Pico 8 text didn't really look right, right? So now you can do that. You can do this trick to very quickly have like big text showing up on the screen or white text, you know, it's just like, I think this also looks good, you know, this is also good or high, you know, tall text, right? This is, these are all good text to make things stand out, pop out a little bit. There's also a, this effect. Hangry. So this is, um, it will draw only every second pixel. So kind of like get like this dot matrix effect, like in pinball machines. And that's why what the P comes from. It's called, it's P like in pinball. Actually it's D, it's dotty. And then you add uh, wide and tall at the same. And then, was it? no, it's not D, it's, it's, it's the dot. Right, so these kind of like these three effects combined into each other. So dot, wide, and tall. Uh, that's the same thing as writing P, and that gives you the the this effect. So we kind of like get the dotty dot matrix kind of thing. Think again, great for like score stuff if you want to have like stylistic choices. You know, whereas like you want to em emulate uh, this kind of like pinball effect. That's really great. Okay, mm, you can also play around a little bit with the font spacing. That's also something you can do. So for example, I am so, uh, then X, so this up to character X, and then a number. And that will indicate you know, how, what the X spacing between between the characters should be, right? So now I'm pangry. <laughs> I'm so angry. That's good. Uh, make it, you can, ten obviously is not possible because it's double digit. You can go all the way up to nine. You can go over nine. You have to just use hexadecimal now. So it's like A and all the way up to F. So you can really space it out. Make like a little cinematic, you know, uh, uh, created by Christopher Nolan. Tenant kind of like tenant, tenant kind of like uh, text here. You can also make the spacing smaller. <laughs> well, zero maybe not, but you know, you can squish the text together a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's there's lot lot of cool stuff, and of course you can do something like this. You can animate this, right? So I did like a little sign function here with time and did some math around it, so it kind of looks like this. So yeah, it's, remember none of this is static. You can also animate this so that to make it more even more interesting. So this is nice. Another thing you can do is, and that's maybe something more basic, you can just also uh, change the color. So that's going to be go, um, this is now no longer this control character, it's actually F. And then the color you want to do, Pangry. Um, yeah, you have to reset the color because this actually changes the color of the cursor. So let's, let's reset to six, right. So now we change the color to red and we have to set the color at the beginning. So it's like changes because this is actually something that remembers between the different lines, right? So if you're going to go print, yes, still do. And then it's still red the next line. So you have to really turn it off now. Um, again, again, this is hexadecimal. So if you go to nine, it's fine. But if you go 10 and that's no longer works. <laughs> so you have to go with A and B and so forth all the way up to F. And so forth. Okay, so this allows you to change the color. Let's keep it red. And of course, you can combine it with invert, just like to just so we, we understand. You can invert and uh, set a color. That's really nice. 
Uh, another thing I really like, and um, because inversion is like okay, it inverts, it puts something in the background, but um, the text itself um, then becomes transparent. So if you put something in the background, right, you can like like the background will shine through. Um, but something you can do as well is just to set the background color of a text. So this becomes now really interesting. So let's set the text to zero and not invert it. So now it's like black text. And now we can use um, hashtag, the escape character hashtag, a new escape character. And that actually sets the background color. So for example, eight. And this allows you to control this box around the character and that, that can have a certain color and the actual letters can have a different color. So now you can really control everything here. I am so pangry. <laughs> so far so good. As you can see, I went just like through a bunch of stuff that changes the way characters look. And then, and then Zep did, did something that kind of blew my mind where you actually can even control the flow of the program. Escape character uptick thing, number, just a number. So what it does is, <laughs> it's kind of a bit, let's, let's actually put an escape character six, with uptick six at the end. We can pause the execution of the program. We can pause the execution of the program for a certain amount of time. One is one frame, two is two frames, three is like four frames, so it's kind of like exponential all the way to F, and that will wait for 256 frames, I think. Don't quote me on that. So yeah, it's kind of like you don't you have less control the, the longer the time becomes. Um, that's weird. Right, that's super weird. What can you what what can you what can you do with that, right? Uh, well, I made a little function here. Okay, I call this slowify, and you can just copy this this function here. I'm gonna actually use it in here in in, in it. Uh, let me put this in here. Uh, print slow slowify. Yes, this is a Pangry dog. Um, I have to close. So we can slowly make a text appear because what it does is it um, it basically it takes the slow fair function goes through all of the characters in the string and it inserts the control character uptick one in front of each of the individual letters and that means like it waits a uh, frame before it prints next character. Can make it slower a little bit. So it's like this uh, animation effect in RPGs, where you know the text doesn't just appear immediately, but like appears one character at a time. Nice. The thing, though, in those RPGs, there is a sound happening, right? Well strap yourself in because you can also make a sound with control characters and the kitchen sink as well i tell you so um this one is actually weird so let's let's print um escape character a does a beep which we can't hear right now. Why? Oh, because it's... No, wait, let's should do a beep. Ah, there we go. That does a beep. There is actually a, like a whole language of what you can do behind the A character. Like, look at this. You can do... Um, for, you can actually... Wait, did we make a sound? Okay. We can actually dr play a sound effect that we already prepared. <laughs> So that would be a zero. And you can actually program your own sound effect. So something like this, I, this is something I copy and paste. 
So this plays the sequence of notes. Um, actually, the, it's more complicated. So uh, then you have the A and then S4 sets the speed. And then X5 says an effect, I think, or like um, the instrument, I'm not really sure. And then this is a sequence of notes. Uh, one problem that you will run into, like, okay, you can make it go faster. Um, like this, right? And then I think this is <laughs> different effects or, uh, I, I, yeah, I think this, <laughs> okay, that's actually the effects of the different notes. There's more stuff happening. And again, this is something that you have to dig into the manual. I'm not a bit of a, big of a musician kind of person. So some of, some of the stuff was just like, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, one thing is like this is this is really crazy, uh, and the problem that you run into is like look, if you embed it into a text, you will get into trouble. Like this is my little song. So this works, but if you remove space, <laughs> it actually takes this part. Obviously, this text that you had here and interprets this as sound. So you have to always put a space here to exit this this A character. The space uh, lets him know that we are no longer talking about the song. Now we can we can move on. So so you know previously we had these examples where the control character would be like right against a like here, right, right, right against uh, the text, the following text, but with the A character, A escape character, you have to give him a space to let him know that we are no longer drawing, uh, doing sound effects. Okay, so what does it mean for our slowify function? So we can upgrade this this little part here where we are adding the the one. Uh, one frame delay. Actually, there's now two frames delays. We can replace this with this. Again, I copied and pasted. So this um, draws, um, this plays a sound effect. Let, let me just play this. This is good. Um, so this plays a sound effect very fast uh, uh, with this thing. Uh, and with instrument zero. Uh, and then it plays randomly one of three notes that sounded good to me. And then uh, space, and then waits a, a, a frame. And of course you can like play around, you can make different sound effects. So you can make your own Animal Crossing. Um, this is cool. This is cute. I'm not sure if I'm gonna use this though. <laughs> like, okay, this is really nice for like sm small little effects like this, maybe like a message box somewhere. But the problem is like, if you're really making an RPG that has this effect, you will probably code it yourself. Because the problem that you have here is that it actually interrupts the entire program and until it prints the entire text, right? So everything else, all the key inputs, all of the, uh, animations that might be playing at the same time will get frozen until this text is printed because again this just waits an entire frame and there is no draw function there is no update function nothing gets called while this text is being rendered so yeah um, yeah I was talking with Frederick about this and and he was skeptical about whether he actually gonna use this and I have to agree like this is this is I think cool for small little programs and small little tricks um, and you know, like little demos and of tweet cards, obviously. Um, but for an actual game, you would probably make this 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 uh, this effect on your own. Still, I'm, I'm not complaining. It's really fun. It's really also nice that we can have a way of putting a sound effect into a uh, string, because every now and then we have like this. Oh, and I want to play some kind of sound effect, and then I have to dedicate a whole sound effect for for that. But now we can just like print a little string. For a little, you know, UI kind of thing. That's 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 really nice. Okay, there's one. I I, I got I, I got one one more in me. Actually, I have two one two two more in me. So there is a V. So backslash V will do interesting things. Hey, me.
there's two numbers characters squished to each other so this is something I, that i have to like read up in the manual and you have to read that yourself because it's a very complex but here's something that you can do here now and i was wondering about that when i saw the the final font set but yeah that makes sense aha uh -huh. cafe something i i really enjoying here in fujo um, so this V is a kind of like decoration control character, decorative font control character. And this allows you to take um, this, this character, this comma, and put it on top of the previous character. So the, the E gets a comma on top. And uh, where exactly that comma goes is controlled by whatever follows V. So this B says that the comma goes ab above E at a very specific place. Uh, and the the problem is like this is very unintuitive and very complicated and this is where it really gets like and because it's like two coordinates are encoded into one number uh, in this thing again right so it's like two first bits are the x coordinate and then the following um uh, was it like the easiest thing is just like to fumble around until you found that one that fits. You can just really basically place where uh, where the where the apostrophe where the comma is going to create like an accent. Agu? French people in the comment section will let me know which accent that is. So. So this is nice because uh, that's something I was wondering when I saw the fonts that I saw, okay, we have Fitagana Katakana and we have some um, Western characters, but like there's a lot of languages that were left out, right? There's a lot of umlauts and so forth that, that are not uh, that are not covered by this font set. So I was wondering because usually that is the priority when you create a new font, like creating all of those different accents and so forth. And this is kind of like the workarounds. You're using this control character V, you can create those accents by combining uh, multiple characters and i think this is really smart this is a really good idea um it would be nice to create like a data database of characters that work and so this is actually the part when when i'm reaching out to you guys this is this is, should be a community thing i shouldn't like this shouldn't be uh, down to one person um we should like create maybe like a database of special characters that are used in different languages and the specific combination of this decorative think this decorator uh, this slash backslash v character uh, that you can use to create the, these special characters um so yeah like we should maybe get together maybe create a uh, um a thread on lex Love forums to document all of this and also at this point i would also say like because this b thing is so unintuitive it might be a good idea to um if somebody <laughs> maybe sits down and creates like an editor for this um so it's a bit easier to figure out what the b is supposed to be because like the the bits the manipulation is something i'm sorry i'm just like not my brain's just not made for this it's just like i can do it on paper but it just takes me ages so it would be nice if you have like pick this character decorate it with this character and then use the keys to kind of position it perfectly i would do it but i have my head fans full so this is a challenge for you guys out there make an editor that that works really nice and allows you to do this decoration stuff Okay, I think we are ready for the grand finale. We have custom fonts. Yes, we have custom fonts. We can create our custom own special font with Pico 8. Here's how it goes. Now, I will say there is a easy way of doing this. And then there's how it actually works the background. The easy way of doing this is actually not that difficult. Should be accessible to anyone. How it actually works in the background is a bit of a thing. Let me first show you the easy way. Let's say you are a person who wants to make their own special font. Well, load hashtag font underscore snippet. Uh, that will download a um, cart from the, um, from the internet and will load it up. You can run it. Ooh, that's nice. What is this? Well, uh, you have a, like a manual of how you how to use this. Basically, it, it comes with a f already font in here, uh, where each letter ha its, has its own sprite, and you can edit this font to 
make it look like you want it to look. Like it doesn't have to, the characters don't have to be that big. They can be a lot smaller. In fact, uh, it tells you how to make the characters. You have to define how big the characters are supposed to be. In this example form, the characters are eight times eight. That's the biggest it can be. Um, but um, but you can make them smaller if you want to. And char height here actually means that they're kind of like, there's spacing between the lines. That's all it says. Okay, so after you made your font, what you do is you run this program and you can see snippet copy to the clipboard. Okay, now you can do a reboot. Actually, I'm not sure if you can do a reboot. Uh, okay, I'm gonna paste it in here and there's something interesting happening. So we're poking into an address and then we're unpacking a split. <laughs> So basically, this actually highlights another function that we, that we just had. So poke has been upgraded to do multi-poke. So what you can do is like if you're poking into an address, you say poke in an address, and you can now add an infinite number or like an arbitrary number of uh, values, separ comma separated, and they will be put into subsequent addresses. So you can like, with one poke statement, you can actually poke a lot of addresses at the same time. And this is really good if you want to edit a lot of addresses at the same time. In this case, what it actually does is it pokes in all of the special characters in a special place in the memory. So it basically installs the font. So now the font is installed. And now if you, we print this by slash backslash 014. <laughs> 014 will turn on the new font. That's good. Um, if you want to turn it off again, I, I'm sure I did. Wait. Is it still on? It's not still on. Um, but if you want to turn it off mid-sentence, you can do slash 015 and then it will turn it off again. And you can already tell, ooh, this looks nice. This looks nice. Big characters and small characters combined. You can do like layout stuff. Oh, excitement, this is good, this is good stuff. Um, you can also poke uh, into a place to activate this. So poking uh, into this, this will activate it. And actually now you can tell that this is now on permanently, right? So now actually both lines are on. So uh, doing this poke allows you to turn off the, the font and off permanently. And you deactivate it by poking zero, I guess. That's how it works. That's, I guess, how it works. Yeah, now this is off. And zero, uh, eight, one. Now it's on. Cool. So I actually went through this and <laughs> I actually made my own font, uh, which I wanted to show of you because I spent a little bit to this, but let's see if you recognize this font. Recognize this? Uh, that's right, it's the Pokemon font. <laughs> it's so ugly. <laughs> it's but ugly. In fact, <laughs> it's kind of difficult to find a font. The, uh, again, that's why I was looking at fonts, Game Boy fonts. It's kind of difficult to find a Game Boy font that is kind of nice and, and, and compact and, and, and neat. There's, I've seen a bunch of fonts being posted around the Lexa Luffle forums and you can check them out uh, of people trying something that's a little bit bigger than the default uh, Pico 8 font, but not this big it's kind of like feels very um, wasteful but hey if you want to like recreate pokemon if you want to have that pokemon feeling you know this is the font that you should go for and i will post it in the doobly-doo downstairs so you can check it out i realized that a lot of fonts and video games that i like actually are on game boy advance you know like the fonts like uh, advance wars or uh, i think the one from final fantasy tactics advance is really nice mother or elfbound you know these kind of like these are really nice fonts but they're too big they're they are made for a different kind of resolution. They won't work on, on a Pico 8, sadly. Ah, but I have, do have a recommendation that you can check out if you're looking for good pixel art fonts to, to use for Pico 8. 
So this is an older page, but it still checks out. Um, so this is called Fontstruct. Uh, and Fontstruct is basically like an online tool where you can create your own fonts, um, pixel fonts. Um, not all of them are pixel fonts because it's kind of like a weird tool that is not just pixel based, but you can actually have like shapes in there as well that are not just squares, but other shapes. So sometimes you get like these kinds of weird stuff, but you can definitely have a lot of pixel art stuff. So pixel optimized. And as you can see, there's a lot of fonts in here. Now, not all of them are low resolu resolution fonts that would work with Pico 8. You kind of have to click through a little bit here, but I think there this is a really good place to look for pixel fonts because there's just so much in here. And there's also a good place to maybe you make your own font uh, because I think the tools are a bit more um, luxurious <laughs> than the uh, tools for Pico 8. It would be actually really cool if somebody made like an exporter. So you can take a font struct font and just like dump it straight into Pico 8. That would be nice. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking for uh, pixel fonts, this is a good place to be. Obviously, you can also check out, um, you know, video games, Game Boy games and see, you know, um, what fonts they are using. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is a good resource. Definitely recommend it. There is a new version of Mapsplorer. Um, I created a new version of Mapsplorer that um, takes into account all the things that are changed. Uh, and also because it was printing random characters here that some of were supposed to be characters actually triggered some of the <laughs> some of the text decorations. So sometimes it would just beep <laughs> because it triggered the audio control character. And this actually lets you know what is happening in the background with the, with the fonts. So this um, sand colored Skin color, I guess. Not skin color is not good because that's also skin color, I guess. Um, and this sand colored um, part here, that is the uh, custom font, and and you can see it kind of ate into the general use RAM, so mm, so you have less general use RAM. But let's be honest, you haven't used it before, so mm, and you can still use this, you know, still use the entire general use RAM. You just won't be able to. Like you will just overwrite the custom font, but if you're not using custom font, why do you care, right? Um, anyway, so this last portion of the general use RAM is reserved for the custom font. This is where the custom font goes. Uh, it's um, um, it's like monochrome, so it's like you know one bit per pixel, so it um, they can compress like a lot more uh, pixels into smaller space. Um, if you click in here. Uh, like the first couple of entries uh, are uh, defining the width of the different characters, height and offset and so forth. So like the, the dimensions of the characters are defined in the first few addresses and then afterwards it's just like a s um, straight dump of the different, um, of the different, um, yeah, of the pixel data. And while we're here, this is where um, there are some, some new entries here. This, there's the print attributes. This is actually uh, like a bit field. So each of the individual zeros here defines something else. Um, this, these are defining, you know, the decorations for Actually, what happens if I start messing around with this? Will, will something happen now? Uh, cowards. Uh, but yeah, the different print attributes like background colors and so forth and inverted and the uh, wide um, font, these are all set in here. And then, yeah, you can, can I do something here? Can you start? Yes, I can break it. <laughs> no, don't do it. Oh God, I have to restart it. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's some entries there that define the width and height of characters and so forth. Um, yeah, all of this is found in here in, in a draw state, one of the uh, couple of entries in the draw state. So these are kind of the new things um, that that have been added. Yeah, new man's block, check it out. We're done. This almost killed me. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> so it's a good version. I love it. It's um, it's I guess, I guess it started out as a polishing run, and then uh, Zep went to, into some deep rabbit holes and added some stuff. Um, I'm not so sure about the fill patterns on 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 sprites. I mean, I'm glad that they're there, but it's not something I will lose my my sleep over. Um, but I do uh, I, I lose sleep over. I am very excited about the. Uh, sound effect filters, these will completely change the way Pico 8 sounds like. Uh, I already heard some things from good chiptune artists and it's just like blowing my mind that, that this is what Pico 8 is, is now. Uh, really excited also for me if I make sound effects and so forth. Uh, this just gives me so much more room to play with. It's so good. 
and it's also implemented in a very great fashion where it doesn't change um, uh, you know completely the way things work before it just adds like another layer another dimension love it and the control characters are and the custom fonts are exciting too yes this is really good stuff this is allows us to you know decorate characters uh, decorate text with a lot less uh, tokens um, nothing that wasn't te technically possible before but now it's it's way better integrated the menu stuff is nice too it's really good stuff so yeah check it out and if you if you found something that uh, you also want to point out that you ex made you excited about this new version do let me know in the comment section that's really useful to always hear what you think about this and again the challenge is on guys like the the creation character let's let's get something going maybe like a thread on Lexalofl, maybe like a little tool so you can build your own characters let me know if you have something cooking i will definitely link it all right so this is it for for today uh yeah i will be working on some of my some exciting projects that will come up soon see you next time guys bye bye